Priya. Our next speaker is Ryan Schicke from Institut Pasteur, Pasteur um, who's going to talk about large scale viral discovery. Thanks. Um, can you hear me well? Is it okay if I take my mask off? Anybody has an objection? Yeah. I would prefer. Thank you. Uh, so, thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, this is really an impressive lineup of speakers during this workshop. So, I look forward for interactions. Uh, I, I hope that this presentation, I'm actually happy that I believe that it's on topic for this um, gathering because it's about large scale omics and I will talk about large scale genomics. Although on a different topic, so no, non human, mainly environmental. It's the same talk as CGSI for those of you who attended the workshop in Los Angeles, but I um, hope you will still find it interesting. And feel free to interrupt me and ask questions during the talk if you would like. So the title is Recent Progress Towards Beta Base Scale Genomics. Um, one, just one slide for my background. And, uh, I lead the Bioinformatics Algorithms Lab at Institut Pasteur in Paris. My research focuses on chemical methods, genome assembly, these organisms are my small contribution to the Earth Biogenome Project, where I assembled those organisms. That was before actually high quality genome assemblies, so I don't think they are being used nowadays, um, but still. And uh, today I will talk about a project which performed petabase scale viral discovery uh, as part of a bigger team called Serratus, and we analyzed all available RNA sequencing data publicly. And we discovered 10 times more viral species than previously known, including a novel, a novel species of coronaviruses. So the context of this work is relatively timely. It's in, in the viral surveillance in the age of pandemics. So currently we are unfortunately at the stage of global spread. And it would be nice if we could discover and contain viruses before they spill over to humans or to other animals. And in particular for SARS-CoV-2, it has been known that it circulated among animals and it currently still circulates. So there are some excerpts from news articles where SARS-CoV-2 has spilled to tigers, dogs, and, and minks. And in particular for recent variants, which have been uh, hypothesized to come from rodents. So to um, potentially investigate and prevent future spillovers. Uh, DNA sequencing data has played a role. So there's essentially two types of SARS-CoV-2 sequencing. One which is targeted, uh, that has been the efforts of next strain, GZ, and, and so on. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you have uh, environmental sequencing, which doesn't target any particular virus. But for instance, the Tara Ocean project uh, set out to sequence um, all the microbial matter in oceans across the, across the globe. And in my talk particularly, I will focus on these types of sequencing data. So you're probably aware of the SRA, which is the biggest database of, of public sequencing data hosted at um, NCBI and uh, EBI uh, jointly. So for those of you who are not, this is a database where you can search by metadata and and essentially download raw sequencing data for um, pretty much all studies where um, the publishing of sequencing data is mandated by a journal. A particular aspect of this database is its explosive growth. So right now it's at 30 petabases, which is 30 million gigabases, and it's roughly doubling every two years. So in 2022, and in two years, it will be estimated to be at uh, 60 petabases of public sequencing data. So when I think about the SRA, uh, I mainly think about a data crypt where the reads are just sitting there undisturbed, unable to be fully analyzed at a, at a large scale. The main reason is because of its volume. Uh, all RNA-6 as of 2020 consisted of 5 million samples, roughly 10 petabases. If we were to analyze all of this data, we would need to first download it. And even downloading is a challenge. As a small exercise for, for the public, how many years would it take to download 10 petabases of data if you had a bandwidth of one megabytes per second? Yes. 
Très ennuyeux. Très bien. Bon. Ça va me Ça va me rendre très bien. Très bien. You can actually ask Google for the answer. If you, if you craft a, a query worded like this, it would immediately spit out the correct answer, which is roughly 300 years just as of download. And you can realize that if, if, even if you had faster access to this database, let's say 100 megabytes per second, it would still take you three years for, for download. So this is highly impractical to do for pretty much any lab except NCBI and ABI. However, we took advantage of a very recent initiative by NCBI to mirror all of this data to cloud providers, such as Amazon and Google. And we were able to perform a cloud analysis of all RNA6. This is a project called Serratus, and we have a website where you can actually explore our results. And I will briefly talk about, talk about our results within this project. So in Serratus, we did two analyses. One is a nucleotide alignment of all RNA secretes against all known RNA viral genomes. And with this analysis, we discovered a new species of coronaviruses. We then performed another analysis with a protein translated alignment of all RNA secretes versus a marker gene of RNA viruses. And through this analysis, we discovered 130,000 new RNA viral species. We did the second analysis after realizing that nucleotide alignment wasn't sensitive enough for the discovery of novel viral species because we were really looking at, at a low homology alignment, so which couldn't be captured by, by nucleotide alignment, unfortunately. So in analysis one, we took the all SRA, all SRA RNA6, downloaded and aligned using a classical read aligner, VOTI2, against a pen genome of all the RNA viral species uh, sequences from RevSeq. And through this analysis, we discovered that roughly 55,000 libraries were positive for containing some sort of coronavirus genome. So to perform this analysis, we developed a particularly tailored architecture that it performs download very efficiently on a cloud using many, many machines, so thousands of machines at the same time, and alignment using also 5,000 machines, and finally gathering of results in, in the form of BAM files containing reads matching some, some known virus. And finally, we put all the data in, in a public repository, which is an Amazon S3 container. And the whole pipeline, in a nutshell, was aggressively cost-optimized to avoid any possible overhead due to, um, for instance, fast queue parsing, downloading, and in order to be, to be um, embarrassingly parallel. So we were able to use up to 20,000 vCPUs at the same time, and the whole pipeline is open source. In terms of performance, this pipeline is able to align up to a million libraries in a, in a day. And in terms of cost, the cost is roughly half a penny per library. And this is uh, extremely optimized. So you would consider that the order, uh, the question I often get is how much does it cost to analyze all of SRA? And it's in the order of a few tens of thousands of, of, dollars, of dollars, which is uh, significant, but not typical nowadays. So this enabled us to analyze, I don't know if it renders very well, this is the world map. This enables us to analyze um, all of RNA sequencing data, and it has been geolocalized because in the SRA, you can get uh, geolocalization of each library. So you can see it's all over the world. There are some, some weird artifacts with, with straight lines, which I believe are uh, not biologically correct locations. In another analysis, we also analyze all of RNA-6, but this time, it was a more sensitive alignment using Diamond 2, which aligned um, nucleotides towards protein reference. And this time, we aligned reads to known versions of a particular gene of RNA viruses, which enabled us to recover so BAM files containing reads containing portions of this gene, potentially highly diverged. And so the novelty of this work is that we created a database of 
the 15,000 known RNA viral RDRP genes, which is a gene that you find in all RNA viruses. So you find it in polio, coronaviruses, and other families. It's structurally very conserved. And in terms of sequence, it has been known that there are three domains, A, B, and C, which are highly conserved across all RNA viruses. So collaborators, uh, Artem Babayan and Robert Edgar, wrote a software to actually extract from any given sequence the motifs A, B, and Cs for, for RDRPs. And this is a software called um, PAMScan, and this motif is called PAMPrint. It's roughly 100 amino acids long. And then using this PAM print, we could define um, a threshold for species by clustering at 90% amino acid identity. So then in this analysis, we recovered all reads mapping to uh, viral RDRPs, and we performed, we performed micro assembly. So we just assembled those reads, which are matching RDRP within each sample using the, a classical assembler and and some uh, not so advanced logistics. So this enabled us to perform a really large scale analysis of, uh, of the SRA. On the left, you can see a distribution of the volume of data per, per type. So there is human data, of course, mouse. We took mammal WGS as a control where we didn't expect to find anything because it's not RNA-seq. And on the right here, this is the proportion of species of viruses which are already known in gray and discovered through this analysis in blue. So unsurprisingly, we found many new viruses in metagenomes, virome's, and environmental samples, but also a few new viruses in human and other mammals. So this is a geographical distribution of, of the um, viral RDRP containing samples that we found. And I won't go too much into details, but for we performed many analyses of these um, different viral families where we expect to find new viruses. So in this sort of graph, you get on a y-axis a number of SRA libraries, and on the x-axis a percentage identity to known RDRPs. Anytime you are in the region between 90% and 50%, this corresponds to libraries containing potentially new viruses, new viral species, which are completely unknown. And so this differs by family. So there are some families which are much well less studied than others. So for instance, Philoviridiae, most of the libraries contain known species. But a few still contain unknown, potentially unknown species. And coronavirus wasn't displayed in this, in this graph, but it looks a little bit like Philo. It's in fact the family for which we have characterized the viruses the best. But still, we found some libraries where potentially new coronavirus species exist. And in fact, this is what I'm going to talk next. So you can access all of our data uh, by typing petabase scale on Google, which actually, it's, it's funny, if you type these terms, uh, all of the first page hits corresponds to our work. Uh, I'll briefly mention that we discovered new coronavirus species in unexpected environments. So. You, you know, potentially the, the usual tree of, of coronaviruses, so alpha, beta, data, gamma. And we discovered new viruses that we tentatively call group E, which correspond to viruses found in aquatic species, such as axolotl, uh, fogofish, seahorse. And previously, there was one, one, one member of this group, which was found in the Pacific salmon. It was the only known. Uh, NIDO virus, and it wasn't clear that it was a coronavirus, but we significantly, significantly expanded this family. One particular aspect of this new coronavirus species is that when we performed assembly, we couldn't recover the spike gene in any of them, which is particularly surprising because normally coronaviruses always have a spike gene. But we looked a bit more in our data, and it turns out that the spike gene was in fact present in the assembly, but on another county. And the striking fact is that normally coronaviruses exist in a single molecule. So we are unable to close the gap between the non-spike containing part of the virus and the spike containing part. If we look at the Pacific salmon 
assembly that was previously known is in a single sequence. However, there are a string of ends at exactly the location where the, we had gaps in other assemblies, indicating that the group which analyzed this virus had performed some manual scaffolding. But currently, our hypothesis is that these viruses are segmented. And this would rewrite the definition of what a coronavirus is, because so far, none of the coronaviruses were segmented. And this has important implications in their evolution, because we know that segmented viruses, such as influenza, um, can evolve faster due to exchanges, for instance, of their, of their segments, more than recombinations. Um, so to perform this work in terms of methods, we perform metagenome and metavirome assembly. So usually metagenome assembly consists of reconstructing all the genomes within a sample, which is a computationally intensive task. In our first analysis, we are focused on reconstructing only the coronavirus species. But this was computationally intensive because to do this, we had to perform metagenome assembly of the whole, of the whole data and then just filter out um, coronavirus species. In analysis two, we only focused on RDRP genes, and this was much easier to, to perform because we only selected reads matching RDRP. For this project, we actually had the help from the SPADES assembly team, which wrote a particularly designed assembler just for this project called Corona SPADES, which optimizes the construction of any viruses through um, better scaffolding. Just to give some um, Overview of what it looks like behind the scenes. So we use AWS Batch, which is a framework for cloud scale analysis, which essentially allows you to submit jobs to the cloud. And it takes care of all the logistics, such as running instances, scheduling jobs, error tolerance, and so on. So it looks a bit like this when I was using it. So you can have a dashboard with number of running jobs, the one who succeeded. Please don't look too much at the one which failed. Um, and you can actually see all the machines which are running and we can also estimate the cost of this analysis in real time. Cool. Uh, for our second analysis where we performed assembly of all our DRPs, we just did it on a single machine, a pretty big one, but it was enough to, to perform this in, in reasonable time. So at this point, um, now we know 10 to the power of five viral species, but we also know that there are 10 to the power of let eight left to discover. So much more work in a, in a ahead of us for RNA viruses. We haven't even looked at DNA viruses, um, but it would be interesting future work. Another one would be to look at even lower homology detection of RDRPs because we are now limited by the sensitivity of both I2 and diamond, but we know that there are these tools are limited. There are some opportunities to do even lower homology alignment. And in fact, some group in Paris has investigated this using deep learning. And finally, one topic that is close to my heart is to create a global index of the SRA using, for instance, KMOS. It's nearly feasible today, but for sure it would only support exact matches. However, if we had this index, we wouldn't have needed to align all the reads to, from the SRA and download all of them. We could just have used this index. However, this index doesn't exist yet. And it's a challenge to construct. Okay, so uh, as a summary, so we performed a discovery of uh, 10 times more RNA viruses than previously known, including one new coronavirus genome. I didn't talk about it, but in the paper, we also look at certain families which are quite intriguing, such as highly compressed viruses, which are only consisting of more like closer to 300, 500 nucleotides, what we call uh, Zeta viruses. We also looked at novel Delta viruses and novel huge phages. Pages. All our data is accessible on, on GitHub and S3. That's a lot of alignment and assemblies which have been left unanalyzed, unanalyzed so up for grabs for any other group. Uh, more details are, of course, in the paper. Uh, many technical details are on our GitHub, and you can chat with us on, on Slack, where um, interested people can design projects with us. It was not an usual project. In fact, this project stemmed from a online hackathon that was held in 2020. And essentially we welcomed everyone. It was initiated by Artem Babayan and all the list of people you see here are um, people who heard of this hackathon and decided to join the initiative. 
we didn't exclude anyone and pretty much uh, every participation was uh, voluntary. So at the end, we ended up being all first author of the paper. So with all equal contribution. In fact, we never met in real life. So it was fully, fully digital co collaboration. So I, I'll conclude with this slide that I took from Artem, but which contains a message that I like. So until this work, the known RNA viral was symbolized by this red dot. And with Serratus, we significantly expanded it by, by 10x. However, we must stay humble because uh, the Earth viral is even bigger and there's much more to discover. So as a summary, there's lots of genomics data and many great analyses could be made if we were able to, to do them. And my belief is that the cloud type analysis help at the larger scale. So these are uh, some credits of, of people who initiate these types of analysis. And I'll briefly conclude by mentioning my group at Institute Pasteur, but if, that's um, pretty much the themes of our work is to do these types of analysis particularly and also others. And I thank you for your attention. Thanks so much. That was exciting. Questions? Thank you very much. Uh, it was very nice. So uh, probably a very basic question. So how, I mean, SRA is uh, full of uh, sequences uh, with low quality. So how you control for the quality of the data that you are using and by extension, your false discovery rate? Right. So we estimated this in, in a paper by confirming that any new viral species that we found was not only found in a single library, but in multiple ones. And um, so I, I also somewhat disagree with the fact that sequencing data is low quality in general. So of course you can have many artifacts such as contamination, um, uh, camera, cameric reads. Um, however, we should have some trust in, in sequencing data as it is provided to us. Really interesting talk also. Um, Question about the biology of the, the proposed segmented coronavirus. So I'm, I'm sure you know that like the discontinuous transcription, what, what, what is your hypothesis for how basically you would get the discontinuous transcription from the RDRP in the segmented case? It would seem to be like a totally biologically different function oh. for the RDRP. Well, so I'm, I'm not a virologist, but my, the way I see this problem is that the, the virus is either in a, present as a single molecule in a host or as, multi, as two molecules. And in the samples, we really looked closely at the assembly graphs and we were unable to find any genomic path between those two molecules. So there is no sequencing based evidence that these two transcripts are ever linked by, by some sequence, which somehow we didn't find. I would love to follow up because the way that transcriptional regulation happens in coronavirus is through the leader sequence being discontinuously transcribed and essentially in a, in a function almost like RNA splicing, but not exactly. And so this would imply if there were actually a segmented virus, then it would imply there's transplicing, which would be very unusual. So. Interesting. I'm, I'm happy to chat offline about this, although this is not specifically my field. No, I also find your talk uh, really great. Uh, I had two different um, questions. So you didn't talk about the length of the viruses um, you found. The, yeah. Any giant viruses also, or is, is your approach only able to discover viruses of a certain length? Or maybe I overlooked something in your slide. No, this is, this is a good question. And in fact, I want to be clear that for the analysis where we discovered 10 times more viral species, we didn't reconstruct the genomes of these viruses. We only reconstructed the a portion of the RDRP gene. So we have no idea uh, okay. of the length of both viruses until we actually go to those libraries and reconstruct them one by one, which would be a monumental effort, which would require us to perform metagenome assembly 
yeah. at, at a large scale. Oh, yeah. Okay, I didn't get that. Uh, uh, my, my second question was, um, we and others have found a lot of um, viral contamination in media. Um, so many different media are uh, infiltrated by, <laughs> by uh, viruses that shouldn't be there. Mm. So, so when you say that you have a sample from a given place in the world, uh, ha have you looked at some of these contamination papers and 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 so we, we did find some unusual host viral associations if this okay. is your question so i remember one example on top of my head is a plant which contained a human virus or an, a mammal mammalian virus so this wasn't expected and the current hypothesis was that the plant actually received um, some uh, poop from an, another viral and it was all sequenced together that doesn't mean that the plant has been infected by, by this virus. So this, this is a little bit different from, from contamination. Oh, contamination, you mean? Because you see then the same virus in many samples because of the contamination of media. Uh, I mean, sorry, doing, doing laboratory lab lab preparation or sequencing? Um, poten potentially, yes, we didn't investigate these cases so, so closely. That must have happened. Did you see the new RNA viruses that infect bacteria? Oh, what is that? A couple of weeks ago, did another big virome assembly, you know, came out after yours, but was arguing that uh, for folks who don't know, usually RNA viruses only infect eukaryotes. Um, and so there's some evidence from these big large scale studies of uh, short read assemblies that there may be RNA viruses that infect bacteria. That sounds very interesting. You didn't it. look in your data. Have a look. I wonder if you see them also. Okay, Probably. one more here. So this is uh, initially was mostly RNA seq, right? But only RNA seq. Only RNA seq, and these are mostly blood samples, right? I would assume. So. I mean, it's pretty much all of COVID RNA seq. So. Yeah, but human probably mostly. So you didn't look at whether there is any correlation with the tissue or whether there were some viruses or that were found in particular tissues or you didn't look at the origin. So you didn't look whether there was some hint of past infection in which you could do some geographical clustering of uh, virus of COVID at a particular time or location. Hmm. Or there is no, maybe not an update to look into this, but maybe there is still to, I'm just asking. I know, so, um, so passing SRSK metadata is, is a bit of a challenge. So, so uh, that would be an interesting question that probably requires some dedicated efforts to investigate it. Yeah. I actually suggest that uh, the metadata is extremely important as well. So if you build an index of the SRA, right. uh, I think having the metadata is a little bit important. It's as good as it's annotated in CBI, right? So, um, Curation of the metadata was, I didn't do this part of the work, but I remember often mentioning that it was very low quality. Oh, as, uh, so, yeah, I, I, I hear you about the index and the question to Great, let's thank both of the speakers. We're now having a coffee break. Uh, we'll be back here at three o'clock. <laughs>